Hello, I'm Tony Walker of the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. I'm going to tell you a ghost story, and it's a true ghost story. It starts over a hundred years ago, so let me set the scene. You may know that there is a headland called St. Bee's Head, which is actually the highest point on the northwest coast of England between Scotland and Wales, and it stands 250 feet up carved out of red sandstone. It's famous because it separates the estuary of the Solway Firth from the Irish Sea proper. It also has a big lighthouse. Now, in the old days, the lighthouse was very important for stopping ships coming uh, ashore on the rocks and wrecking. There's a big old house there called Tarn Flat Hall. Now, what you might not know is there used to be another hall there called Hannah Hall, it is called Hannah Moor, so of course uh, the, the moorland thereabouts gave rise to the name Hannah Hall. Hannah Hall dated from the late 1690s, was a red sandstone substantial building, much the same in style to other uh, large farmhouses thereabouts. It had a reputation as being an unlucky house though, and it uh, sat empty. The owner was uh, a, a farmer who had moved to Norfolk of all places, but he tried to let it out. And people would come and try and farm, but they gave the place up. And as I said, it had a reputation of being unlucky, or in fact, more specifically, of being haunted. Now, in 1821, in the spring of 1821, a young farmer just setting out, 25 years old, called Joseph Messenger, came down the coast from Maryport with his young wife, Dorothy, and a, a, a serving maid. He had a serving maid who was a 16-year-old girl called Elizabeth Coulthard. They set to work in the farmhouse. The farming labourers wouldn't sleep in any of the farm buildings or any of the accommodation there for them. They preferred to live in their own homes and come in. And that was unusual because usually when you were hired in those days, accommodation came as part of the job, but they preferred to live elsewhere and come and work the land and were very reluctant to go into the house itself. So our man, messenger, set forth to farm the land. And while he was doing that, his wife Dorothy and the serving maid Elizabeth Coulthard set to refurbishing the house, which had been empty for some time, and so they cleaned it and they put it in good order and where necessary they painted it and they had plans to restore the wallpaper. They worked from the bottom up and some days went by until Dorothy and the maid Elizabeth Coulthard got to the top attic. They opened the small attic door and this was a very disused uh, room. Uh, I think possibly pigeons had got in, but they closed the skylight and were then surprised to see a small green door built into the side of the wall that looked like it went under the eaves. It was all rusted and cobwebbed up, but Mrs. Messenger asked the, the maid, Elizabeth Coulthard, to hold a candle for her where she drew the bolt back. So it took some work to get the bolt back, and she drew it, and eventually with a creak it came free and revealed within inside the eaves, but a bricked area where there was a niche and there was something in the niche. A merry messenger asked Dorothy to hold the candle so she could see what was in the hole. And there in the hole was something brown and small. And it was very hard to make out what it was. It was dark, but even as the candle flame flickered on it, it was still hard to make out because it was so unexpected. And what was in there was a brown, ancient, human skull. It was undoubtedly human. Well, the two women jumped back with their hands to their throat. I think the young lass even screamed. They called Joseph Messenger from the fields. In he came, and when he came in, eventually he saw it, and it was indeed a skull. So the first thing he said is, well, we'll need to get the police, Mary. So he sent one of his men to get the constable, a William Teasdale. William Teasdale eventually turned up a couple of hours later, and after a cursory examination of the skull, which he took out of the niche, he said it wasn't a case of foul play because it was ancient. There was no police matter to be dealt with here. But in fact, William Teasdale turned to young Joseph Messenger, the farmer, and said, Aye, lad, but I think you need to get the vicar. 
So there was some debate about this, but ultimately it was seen that whatever this was, it wasn't a crime and it would need some kind of Christian burial to maintain the decency. Now, some people may have wondered if this was the cause of the reputed haunting of Hannah Hall, but at this stage nothing was quite clear. So, Joseph Messenger got his horse and went down to the village of St. Bees. Now, St. Bees had a school there, and still has, which was founded in the 1600s, and it had a theological college which was related to the school. The head of the theological college was the Right Reverend Henry Lord. Now, Reverend Lord was, in fact, the headmaster of the school as well, and it was his right to be the senior churchman there. So they went to the theological college and inquired about the vicar, and of course, uh, out comes Right Reverend Henry Lord. And he is intrigued by this story. They haven't moved the skull, they've left the skull where it is because there's some superstitious dread about removing the skull. So Reverend Lord is a bit of an antiquarian as well and he's quite interested in history. He doesn't believe any mumbo jumbo, he's a modern scientific man of the 19th century. Of course he's a good Christian, a good Protestant, but he um, does not hold with the superstitious ways of what he would call the peasantry. But his interest is piqued and he decides to come up to Hannah Hall. And there he sees the skull and it's quite interesting. And he thinks perhaps it's an archaeological remnant from somewhere. And he has friends who are academics and historians and antiquarians. And he, he decides to take the skull away. Now, his aim is purely scientific. Whereas Joseph Messenger and his wife Mary Messenger and of course the young maid Elizabeth Coulthard are simpler souls and all they want is for the skull to have a Christian burial so they ask right Reverend Henry Lord will you bury this in the churchyard of St Bees? Well the Reverend Henry Lord says yes. Now is that a lie? He has very little inclination to bury it in the churchyard. He may ultimately bury it there but first of all he's quite interested in it as a piece of history and to be honest as a curio in any case he says he will and he takes it down to his study and it sits on his mahogany desk with his papers and he looks at it and he thinks about it and he even writes a letter to a friend of his in Carlisle about it to see if he can throw any light on the matter or has anything useful to say but then his thought is taken by the elements of his next sermon for the next Sunday, and so the skull sits there on the desk, forgotten. And that is that so far as it goes, except to say that night, in the middle of the night, a terrible scream ripped through Hannah Hall, and Mary Messenger sat up and her husband sat up beside her and she said, Joseph, what is that noise? And he says, well, it was a scream. And he said, is it Elizabeth? And he said, well, it didn't sound like a woman. It sounded like a man. But certainly it appeared to be coming from the house. So being the brave young man he was, even though he was only 25, he got up in his nightshirt with a candle and looked around the house. And outside their door, cowering was Elizabeth Coulthard, who had also heard the scream. It so happened that for comfort, the three of them grouped together and searched the house. And they found nothing downstairs and nothing on the first floor where their bedrooms were. And so it appeared that if the scream had come from inside the house, as it appeared to have done, it must have come from upstairs. So they made their way candles in hand to the attic and of all the attics the one that they were most worried about was the attic with the green door joseph messenger opened the door of the attic and saw there was the bolted green door and he went up to it and he withdrew the bolt and he didn't know why he'd done it because the, the door was bolted what could be in there but when he opened the door by the light of the candle there, sitting in its brick niche, 
was the brown, grinning, ancient skull. Joseph said, let's lock this room and we'll get a padlock. But Mary said, you need to go and see the vicar. He is supposed to have buried this skull. And so Joseph agrees to do, do that, but he puts it off the next day. And the night after that, the house is disturbed by another scream, but this time also sounds of something moving upstairs, something dragging itself, something shuffling, something moving when the house is in darkness. And when Joseph goes with his candle to see what the cause of this noise is, he finds the skull is out of its niche. It has somehow escaped from the little room that it's in with the, with the bolt across. And then they find the skull moves around the house and they find it in different rooms unexpectedly, grinning at them, filled with such a palpable evil. So there's no other thing for it now, but that at the request of his wife, Joseph Messenger goes down to the theological college again. It so happens it's a bit of an inopportune time because when he goes to the door, the servant Dixon answers and Joseph Messenger says that he needs to see Reverend Henry Lord. Well, Dixon knows that Reverend Lord is at port and cigars with his fellow clergyman and he does not like being disturbed. So he's very reluctant to go and disturb his master. And he tells Joseph Messenger such. And Joseph Messenger then blurts out the cause of why he's come. And Dixon is a local man and he's heard the rumours about the haunting of Hannah Hall. So he takes it more seriously than Reverend Henry Lord does. And so he agrees that he will go and knock on the door. So he goes and knocks on the parlour door. And from inside, he hears the conversation of the educated clergyman of the theological college. He feels the warmth and comfort of the room. And then the door is opened by Reverend Henry Lord himself, who says, Dixon, what do you want? Well, Dixon doesn't know what to say, but eventually, not meeting Henry Lord's eyes, he says, it's Joseph Messenger, sir, from Hannah Hall. He's come down and... Reverend Lord says, what? That farmer's down here again. What's he down here for this time? And Dixon says, he's claiming that that skull has got back into the house and found its own way back to the house. Well, Henry Lord is astounded. He, he scoffs. He says, well, I'm not going out to such nonsense. But then a thought crosses his mind. And without saying anything, he goes to his study where the skull was sitting on the desk and the skull is not there. He goes back to the parlour to see his clergyman, believing they are chaffing him, as they would say in the argot of the day, that they're making fun of him. And he looks to them, but he can't see any sign that they know what he's talking about. They're either great actors or they're not playing a trick on him. His mind is now disturbed and whirling round, he goes and says to Dixon that he will go and see Joseph Messenger. And he goes out and Joseph Messenger standing there with his cap in his hand. And he said, Reverend Lord, I've got to tell you that the skull has returned to Hannah Hall. I thought you were going to give it a Christian burial. And now Reverend Henry Lord tells his second lie. He says, um, I, I did. Well, of course, we know he didn't. Well, Joseph Messenger can't understand this. He said, I thought that decent Christian rites would have put the ghost to rest. And Henry Lord says, what man, there is no ghost. You're talking superstitious nonsense. There is no such thing as a ghost. Well, says Joseph Messenger, how do you explain that grinning skull that screams and moves in my house at night? Well, Henry Lord says, well, this is just superstitious nonsense. You've got yourself frightened over nothing. You're imagining things. There is nothing here that can be uh, interpreted as the work of, and before he can finish, Joseph Messenger finishes for him, the work of the devil. That's what it is. And a steel comes to Joseph Messenger, young as he is. He says, it is your job to protect the likes of us from the workings of the evil one. You must come and fix this skull. So, 
Henry Lord says, I'm not coming up tonight. He says, are you going to leave us to another night of that hellish din? And Lord says, I will come when it's convenient to me tomorrow. Joseph Messenger has very little he can do about this. And so he goes back to Hannah Hall and his wife is very upset and Elizabeth Coulthard is very upset. And Elizabeth asks if she can sleep on the floor in their room. And out of sympathy for her, they let her do so. But none of them sleep much that night because the night is pierced by the screaming of the skull and the sound of it moving and shuffling and dragging. Whatever its spiritual body is around that house. And they know why nobody would ever stay at Hannah Hall. And they are awake right through to the dawn. And then as the dawn comes, they fall into a sleep because the skull is quiet during the hours of daylight. But at about 9 a.m., up comes Reverend Henry Lord, insisting in a brusque manner to see this skull. They take him up to the attic, and it's not there. And in fact, it is now in the kitchen. And Reverend Henry Lord says, well, you, you move this around. And Elizabeth Coulthard, who is perhaps too young and naive to know, place she says no sir it moves of its own accord well of course he gives her a right dressing down because how could she be so stupid as to think that but certainly that's where it is it's in the kitchen so this time the reverend henry lord takes it and he says i'll see tell you what we'll do about this and he marches with it with them at his heels to the edge of the cliff there we are 200 feet of sheer sandstone drop into the rocks at the bottom and the froth and the foam and the endless waves of the Irish Sea. Well, Mary Messenger looks at her husband and says, if earth didn't put an end to this, then maybe water will. And the Reverend Lord hears her and he says, I and air, and he hurls the skull and the skull flies in an arc and then is blown back onto the rocks by the wind and they look down and see it hit the sandstone blocks and shatter into pieces. And they see the pieces fall in a cloud until they hit more rocks and break further. Until the pieces of the bone of the skull are swallowed by the sea. And Reverend Henry Lord says, and that will be the end of that. And then he leaves. But of course it wasn't. And that night... When they were in bed, the scream came again. And that night, by the light of the candle with the two women behind him with their own candles, Joseph Messenger made his fearful way up to the attic and opened a door and went to the little green door and drew back the bolt. And there, in its niche of brick, sat the skull, undamaged, unbroken grinning at them and it screamed and they fell back in great disarray in terror and ran and that night they sheltered with the animals in the byre because they were too frightened to enter the hall first thing joseph messenger went down and he called henry lord right reverend henry lord who did not believe him except perhaps he did because even in the right Reverend Henry Lord's mind, with all his knowledge of science and his belief in progress, he was beginning to suspect that something supernatural was indeed afoot here. So he came up with them and he was angry with them as much as himself. And he went into the attic and he got the skull in his left hand and he said, Bring me a hammer and some tongs and bank up the fire. So that work was delegated to Elizabeth while Joseph Messenger went out to one of the buildings and brought a heavy iron lump hammer. And his wife Mary fetched the fire tongs. And Elizabeth Coulthard banked up the fire with turf and coal and burned it so it was sparking and hot. And then... The right Reverend Henry Hall took the skull down in the tongs as if he was afraid to touch it with his hands. And he took it 
and the fireplace had a huge hearth of sandstone, hard stone, and the fire was burning bright and hot. And the Right Reverend Henry Hall took the tongs with the skull in his left hand and raised the lump hammer in his right hand and brought it down on the skull, shattering it with all his might. But it wasn't sufficient because he brought the hammer up again and smashed it down again, even harder this time. And the third time he brought it down was with all his strength and he hit the bits of bone so hard that they turned into a dust and he cracked the sandstone hearth with his strength and his righteous anger. And then he swept up the pieces of bone and threw them into the fire. And Mary Messenger said to her husband, Earth did not bury it. Water did not drown it. The air did not blow it away. Our last hope is that the fire will burn it. And the fire did burn it. And there was nothing left of the skull. And that night, the skull did not return. But then... The next day, there was a tragedy. The Right Reverend Henry Hall was mounting his horse by the mounting block, by the sandstone wall, outside the church at St. Bees, which adjoins the graveyard. And something spooked the horse as he got on, and it threw him. Now, if he'd fallen elsewhere, he would have been all right, but the way he fell, the Right Reverend Henry Lord struck his head against the wall and died instantly. There was a great funeral in St. Bees, to, uh, to which the messengers and their maid went like everybody else in the village and the great and the good from Whitehaven and Workington and surrounding places. But the right Reverend Henry Lord was laid to rest in his grave. And then another strange thing happened because that night a scream rang out at Hannah Hall and the sounds of the shuffling and the moving in the darkness, and the messengers and their maid huddled behind their bedroom door until light, and when it was light, they left the hall, never to return. It was later discovered in the attic, behind the green door, when the bolt was drawn back, that the brick niche was no longer empty. A human skull sat in it, but instead of the ancient brown skull that had occupied that space, now there was a fresh white human skull. The truth is that Hannah Hall was never really let after that. They could never let it. The farming land was sold off and the place fell into disrepair until it sat as a ruin with the roof in and the rain in and a place for owls and sheep until it was demolished just after the Second World War as a dangerous ruin and the good sandstone reused. As to what happened to the skull that was in the niche, no one knows. And that would be the end of the story, but there is a little ad addendum to it. You may know that in 1983, a very well-preserved knight was found by archaeologists in the a knight with a K, in St. B's churchyard. He was so well preserved they could tell that he had grapes for his breakfast and he may have died in a tournament. He was very well preserved. Well, it led to a search for other um, medieval remains in the churchyard and that meant that the archaeologists had to um, remove some of the existing graves and rebury them in consecrated ground further away. So there was a party um, delegated to do this and the graves were emptied and the bones were removed and reburied um, in uh, with good ceremonies and things like that. Now, uh, one day the chief archaeologist was looking over this gruesome task, but a gruesome but necessary task to preserve the dignity of those who had been buried in the churchyard in Victorian times and the 18th century while, they, while the archaeologists were digging underneath for the medieval layer. And when they were moving the bodies, they had to take all the bones out and move them across. But there was one grave that they opened that was a bit of a surprise. It was the grave of the Right Reverend Henry Lord, who died tragically in that horse accident in the mid-1800s. And the strange thing was, when they opened the remains of the coffin, they saw that all the bones were present. There was one rather important bone missing from the grave of the Right Reverend Henry Lord, and that was the skull. And that is a true story.
Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? You tried. How to do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret?